Hi, everybody. Welcome to Craft Authors in Conversation. I'm Denise Kiernan. Thanks for joining me. And the wonderful Courtney Lilly, who has joined me tonight. Yay! Hi, Courtney. Thanks for having me, Denise. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very Yay. excited. So for people who have been here before, this will sound a little familiar. For those of you who have not tuned in before, let me give you a rundown. Craft uh, started live and in person at the wonderful Little Jumbo Cocktail Bar here in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, due to COVID, we have moved into this online space. But luckily, we still have the support of both Alan Props, our local independent bookstore, and Little Jumbo, our fabulous cocktail bar. And what will happen tonight is, and, and you will see actually a button down at the bottom of your screen, order books from Malaprops. There you, you go. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, that would be awesome. We like to support independent bookstores. Maybe support your own in your community, whatever you feel like doing. Um, support your local cocktail bar. So when we were live here in Asheville, we'd have these wonderful events at uh, Little Jumbo. And for every writer who visited with us, Shaw, the co-owner and mixologist, would create a twist on, or create create a brand new cocktail, or create a twist on a classic cocktail inspired by the writer or something they had worked on. That's and right. he has continued to do that for us. So you, Courtney Lilly, are going to have a cocktail later in the hour, mm -hmm. and we will reveal that recipe for everyone. Yes. This is actually a dream come true. Like literally, I was sitting. I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes because I was like, I should have a cocktail here right now. I don't feel like I'm getting in. There's a lot going on, you know. That is, to, and that is totally welcome in this space to have a live cocktail. Um, so yes, about so what we're going to do is Courtney and I are going to chat it up a bit uh, over here on the on the left hand side of my left, your right. Yeah. Is uh, the chat space so feel free to chat uh talk to each other as things come up in the conversation um as some of you know joe will be lurking in the background uh he will attempt to put up links on the fly about what <laughs> what are we all drinking we will attempt to put up uh, links on the fly about things that come up as courtney and i talk um, a lot of this information will be shared in the recap i will send after the event to everybody who attended, um, have lots of information about how to follow uh, what Courtney's doing and everything we talked about tonight. Um, and if you have a question, however, we would prefer if you use the ask a question button down at the bottom of your screen. It helps keep all the questions in one space so that I don't miss them and we can hopefully get to them. And um, so put them there if you feel like it. So yay, Malaprops Independent Bookstore. Yay, Little Jumbo Cocktail Bar. And yay, Courtney Lilly. Yeah. Hi. Woo! <laughs> it's so good to have you. And you know, it's funny. We were, um, we were talking before trying to figure out when was the last time we saw each other? Was it in Providence, Rhode Island? Or was it in Brooklyn, New York? And even though I'm not sure we landed anywhere on that, the one thing we were sure about is that we were talking about soccer. Yeah, 100%. And it felt like, yeah, because I remember these memories. Denise and I have a friend in common, a very good friend of mine. And we all used to be in the world of journalism. And so it's like, I definitely have a distinct memory. And this is also like, this is you making quite an impression too, because this story goes back to like, it's the 90s. You know, we're not like, <laughs> it's like all these things. That, I know, oh, yeah. it's oh, yeah. like, I feel like I'm working with people who may not have been born yet all that kind of stuff too when we're telling this story about all that kind of stuff but it's like I, it's it's like there are people I, I was just in portland recently and i saw one of my friends who also i hadn't seen in years somebody used to live down here in los angeles and there are people who are such great storytellers and that even if you don't remember all the things you always get a you always learn something with them when they're when you're with them or you hear a great story or their presence gives you an energy especially as a storyteller myself and that was like the impression I immediately got off of you, Denise. It's so funny, you know. Oh well, thank you, and yeah, you as well, and um, and Drake, who is not—I think Drake might be here somewhere, but um, he might be—he might be lurking as well. But uh, <laughs> you know, we we both are big sports fans, yes. and 
uh, both appreciate the importance of sports as a part of the larger culture. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's like, honestly, it's like there's two different, one of the things I think that's been really interesting about sports lately, all of its versions, you know, human beings only understand things through story and sports is such a great way of understanding narrative. That's why sports movies are so great and all and that. Drama. Other stuff. And drama and stakes. Like literally it's like you sit there, whether it's your college basketball team you root for, and they're like, these kids are graduating after this. This is never happening again. It's one of the things that's like, he, like especially in society right now there's always like well there's always next year or always this that like the stakes are usually extraordinarily high especially for the athletes and you feel it where when something doesn't happen it's a huge deal you know and it's not even just like sliding doors of like oh i didn't get into this college but i got into that one because everything will work all right it's like the only time you'll be able to do a lot of things the sports is so amazing for being able to carry on that narrative and i think it's also something that sports does is like, especially in the world we're in right now, there are good things about the fact that like, I can be in Los Angeles and we could all in the global community be having this conversation and being part of it. But I feel like, you know, especially when I was growing up, there's such a sense of localism. Like you cared who the mayor was of your town. You knew the newspaper and things felt smaller and easier to understand. You could, re you know, wrap your arms around them in a way. And sports is one of the last things that really appeals to a localism in a way where like when the Dodgers are winning out here in LA, you feel it. The Dodgers won the World Series and the whole city was happy. You know, same with the Lakers whenever they even though I'm not a Lakers guy. You know, it's like there's something about civic pride in a world that's become so global that, you know, we saw it with the, you know, you talk about being a soccer fan with like when the English soccer teams that decided they're going to do a Super League, the, yeah. the reaction was so strong, it felt like, because yeah. you were taking away things that families had told stories on built For narrative. generations. Generations. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. When, I lived, when I lived in Rome, when I was actually covering soccer um, in Europe and living in Rome, one of the things that struck me really in a way that I don't think it would have struck me, even though I, I had followed Italian soccer for many years, um, I was lucky enough to live in Rome when Roma, my team, um, won the Scudetto, won yep. the Italian Yep. Yep. Okay. Two, two weeks of nonstop celebration, 24 hours a day, could not sleep. Yep. It was so much more than when Italy as a country yep. won the World Cup. Yep. Because that team, that localized fervor and passion and generational love yep. just took over. And it is such an incredible story. And the other thing that I think is so interesting about sports as storytelling is right now like we can stream things and you yep. can binge watch you can't binge watch a sports match that's happening right now you just nope. can't you have to wait to i listen i was li literally like okay is the berrettini jovic uh, jokovic match for the french open going to be over before i have to talk to courtney yep. and I'm like oh my god you know and yep. um and the euros start you know friday and those are things they happen in that moment. And there's a there's a, almost like a mindfulness to it, yep. kind of being there. And I think that that does also translate to storytelling. So what I was going to say is, I mean, I think that, I actually think that watching and engaging with sports and also um, playing sports, whether or not you're any good at it, yep. is actually a really lovely thing to do. In the same way that I think writing whether or not you intend to be a writer yeah. and be an incredibly beneficial thing to you. And do you, I mean, did you find that out younger? I mean, do you often think that like, besides what you do for a living as the, you know, the showrunner and executive producer of, you know, ABC's hit show Blackish, mm -hmm. besides that, as a writer, do you feel there are things about that process that help you as a human? Oh, 100%. yeah. I mean, it's it, it, but it's interesting because it's also my job that it is, it is now. It's just like the what everybody's going through right now when they work from home and their computer and their house. Like all of a sudden, you're like, wait, I roll out of bed and I'm at my office. When am, and I'm in my office when I go to bed. You know that sense of like duty and separation. Uh, has been harder because and it's and it's gone across like reading. I've always been a big reader. 
watching television and film has always been something I've enjoyed doing. And now it's all very muddied together because it feels like it's contextualized with work. And I will say when I was more just a writer, which we can talk about later about the differences if we want to. Um, when I was more just a writer, it was easier to enjoy writing. It was easier to enjoy it because there wasn't the baggage of all the other things, the personalities that you manage as you're getting into kind of like producing and all that other kind of stuff. So like it was, you know, it was a place where, you know, and writing is just so incredibly hard. I'm sure as so many people watching know as they write themselves, it's like, it's, it's one of those things that you put yourself into and you want it to be good. And, you know, it was, it was, it was hard to, you know, it was hard to kind of go through and lose something that you enjoyed so much because it, it is different. It's a wildly different thing. I can't, it's hard for me to write recreationally now because it feels like I need to be doing something productive with this time. So I feel like I've definitely lost something in that regard. But like early on in my career, I definitely was somebody who was like labored over the perfection of writing. Like I needed it to be great. And now I just need it to be because obviously, as we know, the saying is writing is rewriting. But I definitely as a once I became a producer, I think I became a better writer and a more patient writer. I just lost some of the joy of it on the day to day. But like and that's and I think that's very much because of the writing I do is is screenplays and it takes up a lot of time versus the like if I did if I maybe tried poetry or prose where there wasn't connected to these other things, maybe I'd be able to enjoy flexing the muscle in that way, you know. Do you do that? Have no. you thought about doing that? I have no time. I, it's like, it's it's so crazy. It's like, it's been, you know, and literally, you know, it, it, you sit there and you're, you know, and it, like, I don't think the pandemic has helped with any of that because we've all lost senses of time and the re rec what ideas of recreations are, our schedules all got just, you know, disturbed. Um, it's really hard to find time because it's even just starting. Like, even if I like, journaling or all that other kind of stuff feels like uh, the, the ability to turn into a practice, which would be the really way to make it healthy and a really way to make it interesting again, the things that you found fun, um, just like if it's yoga or whatever, like I used to play in a Sunday basketball game before the virus, you know, where I play every Sunday and it was a ritual and it was great to see the guys and do all that kind of stuff. I needed to find ways to embed it into my life to yeah, make yeah. it be something that was rich, you know? The, you mentioned before, and it's one of the things I wanted to talk about, and it's related yeah. to this, you started out in journalism, as yeah. I did. Yeah. Um, what was it about the appeal of how you tell a story journalistically that kind of worked for you and drew you in and kind of, you know, how did that lead to, how did that lead to Hollywood? It's so interesting because I started off in journalism. and it's so funny because like the friend that we have in common, I think was actually a good reporter. I was terrible as a reporter. Yeah. I, you know, I, like, I knew that about you. Do you have any good, terrible stories about how bad you were? No, it's just like I realized three days. I went into journalism because I knew it was a job that people had. Like it's like the Richard Scary kind of way of defining what you're going to do when you get out of college. It's like, oh, I could be a fireman. I could be, uh, you know, a doctor, and I'm a great yeah, plumber. Yeah, exactly. My grades yeah. ruled out ninety percent of what I could do. But journalism was something like when you're in school and you got to make decisions, and it was also like extracurricular in a kind of way. And like honestly, sports journalism that I did in college, where mm -hmm. I worked at the news newspaper and the radio station, and I covered games, and I got extraordinarily lucky, extraordinarily lucky uh, at a jobs fair, career fair. And, you know, and like, I'm not one who pulls like, 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 I'm not very spiritual. It's not like I'm pulling mystical events out of thin air, but I went to a jobs fair out by the airport, you know, in Queens and my brother, I have a twin brother and he was also at the same school I went to and they had a, you know, so he was one of the editors of the paper. So he was like, seriously going to be a journalist. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to this jobs fair. And I just sat around there with my resume and I didn't talk to anybody. I was just like wandering around waiting to get the bus to go back to campus. And at some point, a woman comes up to me and she says, young man, who have you spoken to? What table have you talked to? And I'm like, I haven't talked to anybody. And she goes, nobody's sitting at that table right there. Go talk to them. And I was like, okay. So I went and talked to them and it was the Providence Journal. And they, and, and they had a program, which is basically just union busting, basically. They wanted to get a bunch of cheap reporters where they had like a dozen to 15 
right out of college young reporters that they were putting in their bureaus. And this is a paper in Providence, Rhode Island that used to have an evening edition as recently as a few years before I started right. in the late 90s. Right. Yep. Yeah. And so like they were kind of like when they had all these bureaus all throughout Rhode Island and Southern Massachusetts, Southeastern Massachusetts. They and were they, super local. Super local. Yeah. Super local. And they were filling that, but they, so they needed people to kind of come in there. So they were going to schools and these job fairs. And I sat down at that thing and I had read an article because the New York Times had written some stuff recently about Providence. This was the Buddy Cianci areas. And they were kind of like, and it was making a comeback, totally making a comeback, right? And he and they moved the river, they were building a mall, all this stuff. And it was becoming a hip town. And right in, Family Guy had come out and that reference. Rhode Island, and there was a new show called Providence is Refer Road, referencing Rhode Island, and there's this New York Times article, and it's a place with an inferiority complex, so they're like ready to be on the map. And that so they're right next to Boston. Right near Boston, an hour away, smallest state, you can get across the whole thing in 45 minutes. It's, you know, it, but it's very, got a regional character. And that I knew stuff about Rhode Island when I got there, never having been there, and was like relatively affable. I just started talking <laughs> and sat down with them across the way, started talking, telling them about my experiences, telling them about all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I got a twin brother, by the way, here. And so like, he ends up coming down there. We started talking and they flew me up for an interview. And then I, I literally, I felt like, you know, there's that scene in Goodwill Hunting where Ben Affleck is like the fake job interview guy. So there's no yeah. stake in it. That's basically what I felt like. It's February of my senior year. I've gotten this interview and I'm like, they flew me up and put me in a hotel. And I'm just like, this is amazing. And I'm just like, so tell me what it's like to work here. I'm just asking all the questions that you think people ask when they go on interviews. And somehow I got the job. Somehow oh, they gave wait, me the wait, job. Wait, wait, wait. This doesn't make you sound like a bad journalist. This no, makes no, no, no. you sound like a really good journalist. No, it makes you sound like a good actor, not a good journalist. <laughs> I think they needed people. They're trying to figure some stuff out. Who knows what the hiring process were or what they were thinking. Three days, so I get the job, I go up there, three days into it, I'm like, I don't know if I love asking people questions. So like, <laughs> immediately at that point, I'm like, oh, this is probably not for me. And I start to figure out, and again, it was like, oh, look, journalism. And I remember the moment when I'm there in the thing, the the offices, I've been introduced to downtown, I'm meeting the guy, Phil Kukelski, who was at the Projo, and he's like, maybe one of the managing editors are hiring people. And he's sitting out there laughing and he introduces me and stuff like that. And he's just like, oh, well, you know, you got to do it for the love because you don't do it for the money. And I'm like, oh, excuse me? <laughs> I'm like, there's, there's not a lot of love and there's not a lot of money? Yeah. I I, jo I chose this because it was a job and I knew I needed to get a job out of college. I didn't have the kind of, you know, means where I could like wander the earth and go to Europe and figure myself out. I just like, I needed a job. And so I got a job um, and I thought it, and it was in writing. So I thought, cause I was taking writing classes. I was always interested in writing. I was always interested in reading, but I just didn't know how to, what to do with it. And then I, uh, so no, I knew I was a, I was a bad journalist because I, I, I was curious, which is a good journalistic yeah. trait, obviously. It's I also a good journalist. just writing trait in general. Yeah, exactly. Oh, 100% for life, all of that. It's, life, just, it's great life trait, yeah. Yeah. I just didn't want to be there at all. So, like, I made it nine months there, and then I just hung out for three months in Rhode Island. Like, I don't know what I was doing, going to coffee shops, being bored. Trinity uh, Pond. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And I went back to, to, to New York after that. But like, yeah, I had in journalism, the thing it really, uh, you know, and, and then through college and through my early experiences was writing on deadline, was, was yeah. big, writing quickly, being able to tell a story quickly, um, listening to that's, other that's people. What I was gonna, that's what I was going to ask you is, despite your short amount of time in that world, what lessons and experiences and talents do you think you took from that experience that help you as a, a, a television writer um, today? Oh, I'd say the main thing is I almost, as much as I said I wasn't a good journalist, it's just really the, the ethic of doing it. The practice of journalism has allowed me to be a television writer because I don't put myself at the center of the storytelling and that's what you do as a journalist so much obviously there's there's like you have tone and there are themes and we all have voice and all that kind of stuff even journalists write a certain kind of way even as much as they try to like kind of beat that out of you um for me it's you know i work on a show right now i am in my 40s i don't have children you know i don't have a, i'm not but i work on a family show so i know i need to listen to a lot of people 
you know, I know it's not just on me. It's not autobiographical. Last year, I was also working on a show about a, you know, a teenage mixed race girl in in the 1980s. I, that was not my experience. So the ability to listen to other people and to get the story out of it and that not even just listen to what they're saying, but to be able to hear what they're feeling and continue to pursue a line of questions to get that clarified. You know, so like it's yeah. that it, whether it's writers rooms, whether it's with actors, whether again, it's just the thing that you did in journalism where you have the kernel of the thing that excites you more often than not, people are telling you a story. They don't know what you're excited about in the story. And then you've got to help them get there so you can get more detail out of it, you know, because they're just talking. It's like, oh, it's just my life. It's just my thing. And you're like, no, 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 this is interesting. What's going on? What's more of that? So that was a lot of it. It It's just like, so now I actually ironically ask a lot of questions to people all the time. It's a little more Socratic. It's not like, you know, what were you doing? Where were you? What do you think of this? But like, but it's the deeper part of journalism that you get once you're past your general assignment days, where there's a little methodical kind of a way of like piecing this story together that, um, you know, most good journalists know, and this is the thing that goes for all writing. I'm sure you've seen it too. You get drawn to something because you know there's a story there. But if you yeah. think you know what the story is, it's a bad story. You, yeah. you have to let it grow, and that's where you have the story. So walking into it like by asking more questions and identifying and, and, and like figuring these things out and being inquisitive, you actually find out what the story is and what's richer. You know, the inquisitive, the curiosity aspect is key and you know with anything you work on especially like when you're writing books or whatever i mean like to be able to stay curious about a topic so that yeah. it keeps you engaged and you can always find more questions to ask that you don't think you know yet yeah, you're right because like going into something saying yeah i know what this is i know what the answer to that is i know what this story is that's the death knell that's um, so just anything that just keeps you asking keeps you guessing keeps you moving um that it, it really does keep moving you forward. Now, you had mentioned, um, and this was something I wanted to talk about, uh, the writer's room, which is yeah. of the heart and soul of any television show. Yep. Um, what was the writer's room? Talk a little bit about your writer's room pre-pandemic, but mostly what was it yeah. like during COVID? Oh, COVID was a lot like this. And again, my experience, because I was running the show, was a lot easier than everybody else's. You know, like, because I, because I was talking a lot and making decisions. And so, like, the thing was, I think the passive part of, of Zoom, where I watch people in meetings all the time, and you're just, like, you have you can't change focus. You can't do this. It's getting up becomes a thing. That is extraordinarily difficult. So, for me, because there were even efficiencies built into it. I was running two shows last year at this time and I would go just click a button and be in the other space. Now, again, that was like mentally very difficult, but that was also what I was paid to do. So like, and I, somebody would catch me up, I'd figure it out, make some decisions, go to the next assignment, you know? So it was very practical in those kind of ways. And I would just be like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It was also out of journalism, I'm sure you know too, and storytelling. Like I realized that making yeah, decisions right. Yeah, yeah, deadlines and making a decision as a writer, you can always change it when you rewrite it. Like the yeah. fact, like, you know, like, like, you know, there's a thing, uh, I've always believed this and there's a musician who I'm a big fan of that I follow his Twitter, Jason Isbell, and he was talking about a question about writer's block. And he's saying he doesn't believe in it because you can just, you're always writing or you're rewriting, you know, it's not like you're waiting for inspiration or muse. And so for me, the way that plays out is just making decisions. You're like, okay, well, it could be A or B. Let's go with A. Cause you know, in a week when you're investigating it again, you're like, you know, B would have been better. And you just figure that out. And you go it's down almost the a belief, it's similar to the belief in the crappy first draft. Absolutely. Just get it, just get it out. Just make some choices, get yep. through it, look at yep. it. And then if you change your mind, fine. But you got through it, you got it on paper, you got it done, you got from A to B and yep. you're there. And it's huge. And that's a lot of my process and I'm very process oriented. So like Zoom, didn't mess that up that much because I'm not as visually kind of like now we're in a place where we have like there are a lot of the writers rooms and in in, when you're in real life they have whiteboards here and they're different color pens and they're talking about this person's story in one color and it's and you're being visually oriented to to the path you're trying to go down I I could do a, I work a lot like that mentally only because of laziness really like the right the way I've been in the blackish room for the last seven or eight years I've never faced the board. That's just where my chair was from the get. And so like, 
I didn't look at the board or the or the uh, um, the, the monitor that much. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't need to now because I need to make it make sense in my head versus a lot of times when you write stuff on the board, you're kind of just like, yeah, this is the way it starts in A and then it moves to B. And then you're like, wait, how does it move to B? Like, I know I have to explain it very logically. And the more I talk out, the more I kind of get there because I have to sell everybody on it. So like, so there were things that I wasn't missing. However, if you are in a, if you're a writer in my room and it's all in my head, God bless you. It seems impossible, you know? And it's just like, and I keep saying things and I keep refining it and the writer's assistants are taking notes, but they're trying to play catch up and there's nobody physically on a board saying exactly what I said to say, you know? And they're, they're again, their attention span, their ability to stay focused seems extraordinarily difficult. People of course are, you know, working from home where there are children and responsibilities and all this other kind of stuff, Wi-Fi bandwidth, the same thing everybody else kind of dealt with, you know, um, was, was, you know, we were very much dealing with as well. And it was like, you know, everybody did really great. We triumphed as much as I believe we triumphed and getting through all that other kind of stuff. But it's a, yeah. I mean, like we, you know, the main thing about it was in a writer's room, so much of it is done you know, just like any office outside of the, the outside of the conference room, outside right. of the table. And we didn't get any of that. If you're a new writer, you're just kind of like in our hours and you're kind of doing your thing. How do you get to know who anybody else is? How do we find the stuff that's more interesting and a little different? Because everybody's just, you know, just sticking there. It's like, okay, 10 o'clock time to punch in, you know? So okay. we missed a lot from that. And you're going, you're going back into the room soon, right? No, we're back. We started. Yeah, okay. We are, but we're virtual again right now, still. You You're know? virtual again right now. Okay. Yeah. For last Tuesday, it's 427. Our hours are usually 10 to noon. Then we take a two hour lunch and then we go uh, 2 to 430. So I left a little early for this and uh, and I gave them okay. assignments to do. I hope to God they left early. Um, I, but I usually give them like, another thing that changed is like, you have to be a little more kind of like, think about this or come back with this, you know, because we're, our time is so short. We're only really in it for four and a half hours, which mm -hmm. is not a lot of time when you're trying to figure these things out that I know they have to, I had to sign outside work. And I know I do my own outside work out of it too, either in the mornings or during the long lunch or whatever that kind of thing is to make sure that we're all in good shape. When we, um, talking about uh, story development and character development, um, and I'm, my husband and I are big fans of Blackish. Um, you know, I, characters, I think, are so much of what draw people to television in particular, because you have to stay with them, not just for two hours like you do with the movie. You're staying with them for yep. seasons, ideally. Now, for me, um, you, Blackish, so much of it was about um, uh, who I call Larry Fishburne. <laughs> yeah. Because my first memories of him are as uh, Mr. Clean from <laughs> Apocalypse Now when he was only 17 years old. Yeah. Um, and I'm a massive Lawrence Fishburne um, fan. So just tell me something wonderful about him, just for me. I don't care what anybody watches. Oh, no. He is the most it, there's like there's he's the most wonderful person and like from my standpoint too executive producer you could possibly have he is like you know even in the world of zoom table reads where everybody's remote and doing that kind of stuff he loves working and he laughs at what we do like and you get a laugh from lawrence fishburne about what's going on it's it's it, it's christmas it, it's, it's, it, but he's very nurturing as a creative person, you know, it's like he, he, he's mindful of what's going on and supportive and like, he doesn't need, I mean, again, his, his stature is so huge and he's got so much like gravitas, but he doesn't throw it around. He's an ally only when you need it, you know, and he like, and it's like, he, he trusts us with the material and that's so not the case with most people and like definitely the entire cast like Lawrence is part of the development of the show before I got in there when Kenya was creating it you know they had Lawrence and they had Anthony as executive producers and they showed the father-son dynamic of what the show would be in their picture yeah, watching yeah, this yeah. thing mm -hmm. yeah. it's very practical you see what's going on and 
to then be able to sit there and be so invested in the process of this show and then allow it to evolve and be a positive force in the evolution of the show and never like it just and it's not just about actors it's producers it's writers rarely do people do that and allow it to just happen and trust the people making it. and kenya absolutely had a vision for it but lawrence enabled his vision because like with his ability and his talent if he had said no to anything it's no <laughs> you know that's just what it is and and to trust like that is is honestly it's extraordinary it's extraordinary because actors have to trust people because they're the ones they have to understand the word they have to feel it and get us to connect with the thing just like you're saying i connect with this show and this character because the actor is making me do that and well, they right. believe that they can't you know they can't do it so he is just the best absolutely the best absolutely the okay. best. that's my nerdy fangirl part of the oh, show yeah. I but, 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 but i would like I, I mean honestly i think because you know i mentioned that he was 17 when he yeah. was in one of my all-time favorite movies that I could almost recite start to finish. Yeah. Um, I think it's his time in that industry working with so many different people and his ability to have that longevity and work in so many different, like I, on Hannibal, yeah. you know, I mean, all these different kinds of sh Morpheus, you know, yeah. I mean, all oh, these yeah. different areas. Um, I think, I think for actors, but also for writers, if you work in different areas and with different communities, I think it kind of grows your ability to, again, like engage with the curiosity, stay yep. open to other people's ideas and kind of listen and go. It's almost like a, a mindfulness thing in a sense. Yeah, I, I think it is like, you know, whatever kind of like, like philosophical non-western version of looking at it because it's also like actors routinely put themselves in positions that they've never been in and have to understand right. it and there's a risk in that and i think as writers we're often finding our best work is when you leave the safety of the space that is familiar you know yeah. and so whether that's like changing a community, whether that's kind of like investigating a topic you didn't know that much, maybe it's shifting genres, whatever these things are, like, you know, I always think about it like whenever you travel and you're in a country that speaks a foreign language, I feel like everything slows down. Cause like, if I'm gonna go get a pack of gum, it's like my brain has to work, you know? It's not like I can do anything rote. And I feel like the better you get at things, the easier it all gets and things become rote. And I think creatively, that's obviously a peril because you can't just say, this is how this works. This is how this works. And I know definitely in television, you work very hard at the beginning to figure out which dynamics work. It's like sports in that way. It's like these characters work better together. This world works best doing this. This is the genre. Once you figure that out over a couple of years, usually several episodes, there's a temptation to stay in that 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 palette because it's, you know it works you know the framework works um and it's the times that you take yourself out of that that you find the ability to kind of grow creatively you know that that curiosity can that ability to tweak your tweak your brain in a different yeah. way and it, which often involves challenging yourself and even if you know something thinking that you don't know it. Like one of the yeah. worst things I think you can do as a writer, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or a journalist or television or film, if you're actually talking to someone and wanting to get information for them, from them is to take the stance that um, you, you want to show them how much you know. Oh, yeah. so be an idiot. Yeah. I know, I know I'm an empty vessel, fill me up with what you yeah. know, because yeah. that's when you get stuff you're not expecting. Yeah, it was so interesting. It was like, you know, going back to the journalism thing. I remember one of the like final straws for me in the end of my journalism career was I was doing just a blank, regular rote assignment. It was like Christmas story. There was a- uh, Parade, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, it was like, and it was like, and it was like some town, Rhode Island, and a company was giving um, uh, school computers. That was it. That's the story. And the company's PR people were very involved in getting the computer, you know, and they're like telling, you know, and you can sit there and you're like, I know what this is. And then I got to the school and I'm meeting the teacher and I'm meeting the PR woman. And then I kind of realized through the conversation, this company wasn't giving the school computers. 
this PR woman realized this company was going to throw out computers if she didn't find a place to get them, you know? And kind of like on Christmas Eve, when these computers are about to be thrown out, this woman and this other woman, the teacher and the PR woman made something happen. I'm like, oh, I got a great story, you know? But yeah. like literally if I wasn't like, in that moment, like you're saying, just asking questions, being in that other kind of stuff. You like, and again, like it starts to write itself after a little bit, but it could have been easily just kind of like, oh, this is what it is, you know? Right. Um, here's a PR kind of thing. And it was so fascinating that, you know, it was, and it was a moment where I was really excited. And I, and I was just like, oh man, there's so many things in journalism, like you just got to open yourself up to. And then I think the lead of my article was like, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so, paraphrasing because it's just a, a journalism lead so it's not like the greatest writing in the world but it was also just kind of like you know oh this holiday season so and so and so so figured out that like holiday spirit can outlast even the most stubborn fruitcake right and the editor changed stubborn to long lasting so it could outlast even the most long lasting and i'm like i quit <laughs> like it was just like like and there was no conversation about it and i'm like Anybody who's reading a newspaper, if you're getting, like, you're not going to be confused. Fruitcakes are only one thing. This is like, it's like, They're it's very stubborn. Long, long, and, long. Was, yeah. and I think I could change the word stubborn, but I wouldn't go from long lasting, outlast the most long lasting. Oh, why would you use the same? Yeah. Yeah. No, I bad. No. Bad. I agree. Bad. Very bad. Good yeah. reason to quit. And look where you are now. Yeah, um, exactly. There you go. So, uh, Going back to the idea of character um, and character development, so on Blackish, you ha it, it's it, as many great shows are. You have an incredible and very varied cast. Yep. Now you have very established adult actors, and you, as as a writer, you're creating character arcs for these people. When you're creating character arcs for adult humans those humans are pretty set in who they are, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, um, and I'm, I'm thinking about this, I'm gonna backtrack a little. Yeah. Um, my, my husband, Joe, who's also a journalist and a writer, his first job out of college was at Write On Magazine. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was, one of the things he noticed was that um, when the Cosby Show was really popular, and Fresh Prince of Bel Air and all those and all those shows, nobody cared about the adult actors. Yep. The, the fandom and the insanity was yep. around the kids. Yep. And depending on what age the kids were, they had their own kind of following. Yep. So when you're writing for when you're writing for kids, so your characters grow your adult characters grow, but you have actual humans that started very small on the show. Yep. Yep. And then they turn into preteens and adults and all that sort of stuff. Does your, so there's sort of this non-actor human evolution going on. To, to what extent does the develop, I hope I'm asking this right. To what extent does like the development of a, of a, of a kid into a teenager affect how you write about that character because yep. that person is going through stuff that the adult actors are not going through during the course right. of the television show. It's a great question. And one of the things is like, you know, I don't like, again, I get in this argument, you know, people can argue about it for days. I look at television in particular, not like as an art and we are artists, but more like it's a craft and we're artisans. So like there's a very practical, real, ground level way of approaching it. So when you start off on the show, like they had the blackish part of the reason it succeeded is it had great actors and it was built really well. The foundation was amazing. And so like they sat there and they had two older kids and two younger kids, you know? So the two older kids are at a place where you could tell stories that have stakes as a parent, you know, because they have will. The teenagers, the adult, like the teenage boy and the teenage girl are old enough to be willful. So there's a struggle and there's a drama in it. The two younger kids though, are just cute. So they're funny. And they also built it really well. So you put both of them together. So it's but not- But is so devious. Yes, she's so devious. It, it, but that was also stuff that, and then when you talk about the real world implications of it, that's just stuff that happens over time. You start, you try things out. You sit there and you're like, 
Let's see if she plays sweet well. Nope, that doesn't work. We're not going to do that. Let's see if she plays conniving well. You know, she's a little more deep. Like the things, if you go back when you watch the show from the front to the back, again, you'll see us take these efforts, figuring out what the office looked like. What is that world? And in the best version, in the best case scenario, every world flourishes, all these characters develop, all these worlds grow. But we cast the particularly the youngest actors, you know, Marseille Martin and, um, and, and Miles Brown, when they were so young, they could have been bad. And then you would just see less of them. That's what would have happened. <laughs> you know, they ended up being very good. And so we could grow with them. So all the ideas we might have had about the stories we could tell, the situation we're in now, where seven now getting into our eight seasons later, we're able to approach other teenage kind of stories that we weren't able to do the first couple of seasons because of just time that we can still have this life is just coincidence. We would have changed it. It's luck, you know, and as a writer for television, you know, like every time anybody comes up with a story Bible or this is the arc of what they're going, if it's not based on like, you know, you know, intellectual property or something like that, they're usually making it up. And they're like, hey, all those, here's a entire first season of what's going on. You will use all those ideas in the first three episodes. You will, because you're just holding stuff back. You know, you're holding the drama back. You're sitting there, you're waiting till the end. And then like, that's when they find this out. And you're like, yeah, they should really find that out at the end of the first act. <laughs> and then they're moving forward. And then the thing that you think they find out at the end of episode three, that's the end of your first episode. You know, it all, you just push it all together because the drama like desires it, you know, just like if we, we think we know the story ahead of time, we're going to find further and further we get into it. It's just like, no, the story's asking for it because we're not moving forward. Um, so yeah, we just got extraordinarily lucky. And then once we got into the place and they ended up being very good, we were on a journey with them or growing with them, you know, and, and, and to your, or one of your earlier question, it very much is like journalism because nobody knows where it's going when you're starting. And whoever says they do, like the people who did Lost and said they basically lied to us, said they knew where it was going at the ending, didn't. They had no idea. You can't do it. You're not setting up clues. You're not being clever. You know, all the shows that think they're doing that also are all the ones like previously on because nobody remembers <laughs> anything. You know, even in the internet age, it just doesn't work like that. And especially in network where I've worked almost exclusively, it's like it's you don't have the time to sit there and like lay these little jewels and people aren't watching like this. They're talking like these shows are 10 hours long. They're not a movie where you're gonna remember something at the 30th minute and it's gonna trigger an emotion in the 90th. You know, these are things that are done over a long period of time. The internet helps out and makes you allowed to feel like there are Easter eggs and clues and all that other kind of stuff. But it is, it is, you are just, it's a constant process of discovery on the page that then once you start to shoot it, you will continue to discover some more because you're like, this joke is hilarious. It's the greatest joke I've ever heard. It's amazing. This actor can't pull this off. We got to change it. It's just what it is, you know? So you are actually responding. You're responding to everybody and the actors in general, but in a sense, kind of responding to how those younger actors have developed over time. Absolutely over time. And like, again, and like there's the, like, you know, with your husband and the magazine, it's like those, that was the audience saying that like, this is what we're figuring. That, and this is the poll. This is where we, you know, Bill Cosby's already famous. This was the thing that was like keeping people invested in a way and that, it, you know, in an extra way, you know? Um, but, you know, story-wise, you know, you may say, hey, Diane's doing really great. She, we need to have some more of her. But then you realize when you get into, and it's not specific to Marseille or anything that we're doing, you're like, but they really work together as a team, you know, just throwing her off on her own doesn't work. You know, again, that goes back to the sports of it. It's just like, you know what Carl Malone was really good at working with John Stockton. Why would we separate them? You know? Oh, Mello and Stockton. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We can't even start. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the ability to stream, okay. Yeah. The ability to binge watch. How has that, because there is a pacing to television that is different than film, yep. how has the ability to stream and like watch 10 hours in a row kind of affected how you guys approach that this storytelling? I would say it has not affected how I tell stories because I think the way I tell, again, I'm a big music fan too. Um, I think, you know, the best songs aren't all noise, you have moments where other things sound like stand out. You need silence as much as you need noise. And I think we're, if you're looking at 
film or television is like, when are you building to your emotional crescendos? What's the sleight of hand to make you think you're going to go this and you're going to give them that? You know, it's the same kind of thing in all writing, you know, where you feel like, I remember once reading, uh, you know, uh, a Tom Parada novel, the, the Leftovers, the novel of it, and getting toward the end where I'm looking at the page count and I'm like, holy shit, there should be a word in the English language for when you get to that moment in a book and you realize there aren't enough pages left to have a happy ending. You know, because I was wanting, I was in it so emotionally for where these characters were. And I was drawn, and I think that's ultimately what we're always trying to craft is the, the help, like, especially in comedy, where you're trying to elicit an involuntary response to make you laugh. We're trying to control and manipulate an audience in a way to, to meet our ends. And I look at it all emotionally. Um, I think streaming is an economic thing. So it's about how do we get you to watch the next thing? So I'm uninterested in it, you know? Like, I think, like it's the difference between like I need I'm hungry and so I eat something that's just to keep me from being hungry versus I am hungry I want an experience in a meal I feel something like where I'm like I've never had these combinations of failures before I've never thought about it this way somebody's presented and brought me into a new way of looking at things and I think under the streaming model yes you can absolutely do that we've seen shows that have done that um, but the thing that episodic television did so well, and I think you can find a way to bridge the two, is that like they had to keep you there not for 15 seconds while Netflix counts down to the next episode. They had to keep you there for another week. You had to be invested in who those people were so that you would come back and not have something better to do. You know, and um, so for me, and again, I still work in network, I very much approach writing as a journey, an emotional journey that I want the audience to go on so that like you don't need that counter. Like I almost don't want for also for conversational reasons. I think like sometimes if you're really enjoying something, like why would you like it, it, it feels gluttonous in a way, you know, to sit there. It's, it's called binging even if you think about it. It's just like more, more, more. It's like I'm going to watch all eight hours of it instead of like, Oh, I watched an hour of it and I feel a certain way now. Like, you know, you walk out of a great movie and you're in that dark and movie theater, and you walk out into the daylight, all of a sudden like reality hits you back again. And you've got to process and think and sit with what you just experienced. And something about binging eliminates that because it's even if it's the best emotional ride, they're asking you to go on it again, you know, or something different. And it's and it's and again, it's an epic economic thing. And so for me, creatively, it's just not I'm just not interested in it but you know it's the way the world is and there's i'm sure there's a happy medium you can bridge the two um but for us in the network world because we go week to week to week and i think we've seen it like reality shows the bachelor people love sitting in an episode of the bachelor or whatever and then having a week to talk about it and going back with their friends at the water cooler tweeting about it all that other kind of stuff binging when you release it all at once then it's out there and i you know my former boss who created the show kenny barris who did that show black af he said he felt that when he, he worked so hard for a year on something and then he released it and it was gone and it was just a catalog thing like everything else and he relied on vulture and the internet and criticism to keep it alive versus i'm out for here i'm being like kind of like distributed for eight weeks or ten weeks where it's part of the conversation and there's like kind of like a natural flow to it um i think we'll get like look some things like people want to binge there should be things that are bingeable but like it's never been like again not to just sound like you know somebody whose day has passed but like it's just never been something of interest to me you know i no, i i i totally get it i think it's i i like the meal comparison actually yeah. because it's the idea of savoring the experience of what you're engaging with of of what you're watching and what you're seeing okay yeah. random random question okay yeah. do you do you have you seen Jesus and Mero under lockdown? No, I've not seen them under lockdown, which I feel bad about because we actually had them on one of our episodes, and I think they're very funny. You know, okay, I missed, I missed, I missed that one. I told you I was behind. Oh no, no, yeah, it was the one we did an election episode that was animated. We had them on it last year. You know, okay. back when we were just like trying to find personalities to be in our animated. Okay, episode. what I've always wondered. So I've watched Jesus and Mero for a long time, and. Um, okay when they went to their virtual, you know, the, the, the COVID, the COVID version of the show, Jesus yeah. is always in front of his sneaker wall. Yeah. There was a big part of me that thought, did he get the idea of the sneaker wall from Anthony Anderson's closet? Mm -hmm. 
and blackish because I love I I Frank I have a flu bog problem and people who know me when I did craft live I would wear different flu bogs pretty much oh. for every event. I, like I have my I can I can appreciate the wall of like wanting to look at your shoes. Um, but I did always I did I love I love um I love Anthony Anderson's uh sneaker closet and blackish. And I, I often when I saw Jesus's wall, I thought, oh, that's cool. That reminds me of blackish. Yeah. Oh, it was one of the most genius, like again, watching the pilot early on, and it was like really an amazing piece of character development early on. You sit there, first of all, like sneaker culture, seven or eight oh, years yeah. ago, exploded uh, like over the last seven or eight years, but there's always something. But it was like the first real primetime representation of sneaker culture. It was a great characterization of who this person was, both as far as socioeconomically where they were, the fact I mean, that they're yep. cool staying on this thing. And it's like, and the design of it, Maxine Shepard, who was like our, our production designer, she did an amazing job in that room. And I was, and I rarely see pilots or shows that do something that well. And again, Kenya's a writer to find that thing. He's like, in the first couple minutes of this, you're going to know exactly who this guy is visually and filmically. I thought it was an amazing, amazing thing. And it's still something we come back to every now and again, because it's such a beautiful place to shoot, you know, oh, yeah. um, but it is like, yeah. And now we're all in that world. Like, you know, oh, I got my books behind me. You know, you figure out like how we're all going to, be you know kind of like you know these um these these um you know these designers these these set designers because like it was a fantastic piece of set design you know oh i love it i loved it i loved it i loved it um okay i would be remiss if i didn't ask about we like to talk about process great uh, do you ever write by hand no i don't i've never done that i always type we have a software program final draft where you do all that kind of stuff. I'll say this, I edit usually by hand. Like uh -huh. I write in a draft and all my notes. And even now, even though I do things virtually, there's a great program, which uh, Scriptation, which is just basically a PDF reader, but it's specifically for the entertainment industry. And the thing about it is like, I will do, I'll take the PDF of the script and I'll use my little pen on my iPad and mark up the entire thing. And then I can send that PDF to everybody so they can do the rewrites as much as I need to. So mm -hmm. process for me is like, like I, I, I can't edit in in the program like the type typing program. The word you process. print up? Do you print up and make your make your edits? I used to print up, but now I use this this PDF. Revision. Okay. Yeah, the revision, revision. But I but even using the PDF, I handwrite the notes in the PDF because I know that's different. And like mentally for me, that makes it different than. And I oh, need. So there's a lot of there's a lot of research to back that up. Yeah. It just yeah. needs to be different, like erasing and rewriting. I'm like, no, you know. No, the 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 connection between your hand and your brain. They, there's a whole body of neuroscientific research into that that's really fascinating. Um, so, scriptation and final draft are your favorites. Are there any specific times of day that you like to uh, read scripts and or do your writing? I, you know, it's funny. I don't know if it was like one of those those financial people, Susie Orman or somebody who talks about like that, like how you're supposed to save. And even if you have debt, you're supposed to like put money away for saving. And the way she phrased it is pay yourself first. So yep. for me, it's always first thing of the day because I know I won't, and everybody has their own processes. You know, last year when I was running two shows, I would wake up at five to exercise and then I would get cleaned up, get showered, make sure I was on set by seven for the first shot. And from seven to 10, um, I would write and read, you know, and, and those were the times because I knew 10 o'clock, usually people would start having questions. Like that's when fires need to be put out, blah, blah, blah. And I know that at the end of the day, even with my best intentions, I'm going to be tired and unless like, unless there's a deadline. And so for me, it was the thing that I knew and television, like you mentioned earlier, is really a writer's craft more than a director's craft. And it is, and the words need to be right. And you need to be able to translate the words into emotions and make sure it's clear to everybody else. And the page is, is so much and so important that I needed those three hours to work in the page mm -hmm. and not interrupt it as much as possible. So yeah, for me, there's something about getting further into the day where you're, 
your brain starts to be filled with other information that gets almost gets in the way of being able to process what you need to um, absorb as you're reading or create as you're writing. And that extra information, that bombardment, especially with all the digital stuff, if you don't get it out of the way in the morning, for me, you, you lose kind of a, almost like an intimacy with your craft. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a big ritual person too, as far as like, again, that goes back to sports. I think like it was, it is, this is the time of day I'm doing this, you know, and, and, and like getting into building an actual habit of it. It's just like, okay, here's what I'm doing. I will feel off if I'm not doing this now, you know? Yeah. Okay. All right. Before I, I, I can't forget, um, we have to see your cocktail. Oh yeah. So thank you as always to the amazing shawl from Little Jumbo here in Asheville, North Carolina, where Courtney's going to come visit someday. Would love to, would love to. And, and maybe we'll do a live a live craft here when he comes to visit. So Shawl always chooses something that has some sort of historic um, background, as does this cocktail. This is, a, this is an old cocktail that was actually created in San Francisco. All right. And you should be able to see it on the screen. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Manhattan. There it is. And so this was a this was a San Francisco twist created years ago that um, was based off of the traditional Manhattan. Fantastic. So here, isn't that great? That yeah, I feel like I have a lot of those ingredients as I'm looking at it. I like hearing that. So um, I actually have pretty much all these ingredients, but um, <laughs> my favorite thing is uh, it's in one of my favorite glasses, which we could get into glassware for like three hours. Is it the, a coupe? Coupe glass. the coupe. That's what I was going to get. I'm like, it's got to be in a coupe. It's got to be in a coupe. Oh, it's got to be in the coupe. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is, this is for Courtney Lilly. Oh, and uh, this is his twist on the Black Manhattan, which Fantastic. was uh, created out in, in San Francisco. And um, click to close my eye. How do I stop doing that? There we go. Um, so yay, that's the cocktail. We have at least one question because we're actually getting close to the end of the hour. Oh, we're we so generous. Okay, Angie asks, I'm curious about how writing changes when you go from writing alone versus how you write collaboratively for television. Yep. How is the process different? Does that affect the perfectionism you talked about? That's a yes. fantastic question. Yes, 100%. I think the thing I had to learn, all writing is rewriting, A. The thing about writing for television in a group, and it's very, there's a hierarchy. It is not a democracy. These things are basically totalitarian states run by the individual who's got the keyboard at the top, whoever's in charge, is, is all writing is rewriting. I had to let go. You know, and because my job, I remember early on, there was a writer who I worked with and he talked about how comedy writing and specifically is a volume business. And he kind of meant it in both ways that the word works because volume, like you need to get attention, be loud, make sure that like your ideas are getting out there. But he also meant by, all right, that idea didn't work, I got another idea. That idea didn't work, I got another idea. We're solving problems in the head of uh, whoever the head writer is or the showrunner you know, where they're kind of sitting there going like, I think I know 75% of where I want this to go, but I need it to go here and I can't express exactly what it is. Sometimes they're like, no, I need a different example. And then boom, you have six different examples. Sometimes they're just like, I don't know, I can't figure it out. And you're helping them build this thing. But, um, and that's all very verbal. So that's not really writing, you know? Um, that's again, coming up with stories and pitching. And I think on the page where it really was different was I would spend all this time going through it. And I, and I realized what my draft was, was a best, like there's two things. One was I got to put my best foot forward. I want to show that I'm complete, that I'm thorough, that I have, you know, good spelling and punctuation. I'm not showing anything sloppy because that's showing respect to the show and the craft, but your work really is to make your showrunner or your boss's job easier. If it ends up being great, that's good. They're going to change it anyway, but they need to read it cleanly. They have to sit there and enjoy it. And that way, if and when they do change everything, they're like, oh, you didn't give me more work to do. That's it. You know, and that was a long process to understand because I wanted it to be 
you've asked me to go out and do this thing. And here it is, this perfect piece of thing, which they're never going to think is perfect because it didn't come from them in a way. And even if they allow authorship, which happens on different shows, and I do versions of that, they're going to change a lot because this naturally has to. Conditions may change. Budget may change. Things may change. You may have a joke that'd be great that they've done in another version of a script or whatever's going on. So you have to be a lot less precious with it. And the thing is, you have to be, you learn to be flexible, you know, with your writing. And I thought for a long time, it made me hate writing. I thought I hated writing because I would like, God, it just felt like a struggle because you're always trying to get these things to hit a target, like in this tiny bullseye, this other a person. moving target. Yeah, yeah, moving target. And if they could express it at all. And what I realized was I didn't hate writing. I liked writing for myself when I started doing more pilots and doing stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I actually enjoyed this again. I can make this up and then I can deal with notes, which is a whole different thing. But like it was, I had to let go of the perfectionism. You just have to. And I now it's helped me out a lot. I'm a showrunner part of the process because it is all the only time I have to get it right. And there's so many different ways. When you're creating the story, you want to get it right. When you're writing the actual draft, you want to get it right. When you're at the table read, you want to get it right. But then it's shooting and it becomes a whole different thing. And then you're in editing where you change stuff. There's a big thing we do where we, like I look at all of it as different versions and it's just making it more successful as we go, where a, a script may be completely different at the table read and you may cut entire scenes when you get into the drafts of it because you don't need it, you know, when you get into the actual edit of it because you don't need it. And it was necessary to make people understand in one phase and becomes unnecessary in another phase. You're like, the, the you should be mostly, you know, loyal to the story. And just like what we talked about at the beginning, when even when you have a draft and this is the draft that we're going to shoot, you still don't know where the story is going to go. Even when you're on stage and you're dealing with the scene, you still don't know where the story is going to go. When you get to the edit, you still don't know where the story is going to go. So I think just like that process was good about for me about letting go because I don't know where the story is going to go. You know, follow the story. I love it. Okay, so we've hit some we've hit some great stuff. So letting go of perfectionism and ritual and staying with your curiosity this is this yeah. is fantastic i think these are good things to leave people with um next uh before we go next time on craft is joseph dagnese author of so many things in particular sorceress kringle right. santa's a woman by the way <laughs> and she's a badass so tune in in july to hear about sorceress kringle and award-winning mystery writer and journalist, and my husband, Joseph Degnes. Um, It's going to be spectacular. But um, Courtney, you were awesome. Congratulations on on everything, and thank you for this. This was this was incredible. And everybody, I will be sending out a recap of all this wonderful stuff, um, software and movies, and all the stuff that that Courtney and I talked about. And uh, everybody stay with your curiosity, let go of your perfectionism, follow your craft, follow yeah. the story. And Courtney, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Denise. It was a joy. I would travel to do this. I would leave my living room to do this. So do it. You you're coming, you're <laughs> coming to Asheville. We're going to Little Jumbo. I'm putting my fancy boots on and well, I'm my cocktail then. That'll be perfect. That'll be it's perfect. on. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. You. We'll All see right. you soon. Bye bye. -bye.